In the IELTS test, you hear some recordings and you have to answer questions on them. You have time to read the instructions and questions and check your work. All recordings are played only once. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a man and a woman discussing the repair of a television. First you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. You will see that there is an example. This time only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning, madam. Can I help you? Yes, please. I bought this small TV set here recently, and when I got it home, I couldn't get it to work. Oh dear. Well, I'd just better take some details for this worksheet, and then we'll have a look at it. OK. Here we are. Now. Can you give me your name, please? Philippa Hutton. Could you spell Hutton, please? That's H-U-T-T-O-N. So, Hutton is the correct answer. Now we begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, as the recording is not played twice. Listen carefully to the conversation and answer questions 1 to 5. Good morning, madam. Can I help you? Yes, please. I bought this small TV set here recently, and when I got it home, I couldn't get it to work. Oh, dear. Well, I'd just better take some details for this worksheet, and then we'll have a look at it. OK. Here we are. Now, can you give me your name, please? Philippa Hutton. Could you spell Hutton, please? That's H-U-T-T-O-N. Thank you. And your address? 13 Glen Avenue, Westley. Do you know the postcode? Yes, it's WE58GF. And what's your phone number? My home number is 01748524965. And my mobile number is 07745276145. OK, got that. Now, did you still have the receipt for the television? Yes, it's right here. Let's have a look. Right, so you bought it on the 5th of June, that's two days ago. So what exactly is wrong with the TV? Well, I bought it two days ago so I could watch TV while I was cooking for the family. That's why I just bought a nice small one. It could fit on the shelf next to the dining room door. Anyway, when I got it back and plugged it in, there was no response. Nothing at all. No lights, no sound, no buzz. And there are no electrical problems in that room? No, nothing. It isn't just me. My husband is very good with these things, and when he came back, he checked the plug, the fuse, the connections, everything. He couldn't work it out either. Hmm, that's very strange. Right then. I'll have a look at it. I'm actually not busy right now. I can finish it in about half an hour. Do you want to wait here or come back later today or tomorrow? I'll go to the supermarket across the road and get some shopping done, and I'll come back in about an hour. Is that all right? Yes. I'll be able to tell you what's wrong by then. By the way, your job number is J25, but it doesn't matter as I'll be here when you get back. See you later, then. Before the conversation continues, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 6 to 10. Hi there. All my shopping's done. Have you finished? Oh yes. It didn't take me long. It was actually the first thing that I checked out, so I had it all figured out in about five minutes. What was the problem then? It was a loose wire. It's amazing that this television even got through its tests. I suppose that nowadays not everything is tested properly, and they just assume that everything will be all right. With all the things that can go wrong, though, with bad connections, faulty chips, the screen dynamics and everything, it's amazing they all don't go wrong more often. So, what can you do about it? We can repair it by tomorrow, or we can just give you a new TV. We can send the old one back to our suppliers. That sounds best to me. I'll take a new one, please. Do you want the same model and everything? Yes, please. Oh dear, I'm afraid we don't have that one in right now, but we will be able to have it in tomorrow morning if that's OK. That's fine. And while I'm here, I want to get something else. It's my nephew's birthday next Thursday. What would you suggest? Well, we've got lots of things here, obviously. How old is he? Let's see. He's the same age as my own son. He's ten now and his birthday is next week. OK. We've got lots of computer games over there. We've got iPods in the corner if he likes music. He can download music from the internet onto his computer and then onto his iPod. There are lots of accessories for computers. He could need a new mouse, a wireless keyboard, a camera to use when he's chatting. There are lots of possibilities and it depends, of course, on how much you want to spend. I'm pretty sure he'd like a computer game, although I know he's got loads already. I'll tell you what... I'll go back and ask his father what would be best, and I'll come back tomorrow and buy something while I'm picking up the new TV. What sort of time shall I come tomorrow, then? We open at nine o'clock in the morning. I'd hope our other shop would be able to send the new telly over this afternoon. They might only manage it tomorrow morning, though, so come over at about eleven. I'll come an hour later at noon, then, as I'll be swimming at eleven. That's fine. I won't be here, though, at noon. I'm taking an early lunch, then, and I'll be back at one. Don't worry. I'm sure everything will be OK. Thanks very much. You're welcome, madam. Bye. Goodbye. That is the end of section one. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 2. Section 2. You will hear a policeman giving a safety talk to new students at the University of Westley. First you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the safety talk and answer questions 11 to 15. Good morning everyone and thank you for coming to this lecture on safety. This lecture is of course optional for all students at Wesley University but it has been laid on by your students union to help you and both the staff at Wesley Police Station and the staff here at the university urge you to attend the other lectures like it and also to get your friends to come too. So, that's enough from me. I'd like to introduce you to Police Constable Fair from Westley Police Station, who is going to give you some hints on keeping safe. PC Fair. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for allowing me to come here to talk to you. It really is a great idea for someone from the police force to come and talk to you, as it may save you time, money, 
and also it may help to protect you. I hope I don't sound condescending when I point out some ideas, as a lot of things really are just common sense, but it is often forgetting these common sense things that can lead to problems. First of all, the thing that students are most likely to suffer from, whether they are in digs or in hall, is theft. You hear a lot of terrible stories about muggings, rape and fraud, but these are not really that widespread, and we'll talk about some of those things later. Thieves know very well that student lodgings are a good place to find electronic goods, wallets and bags and the like with little or no protection. So make sure that your room, house or flat is securely locked each time that you go out. Don't leave valuables in the open where they can be spotted from the window. See if you can get an extra lock on your window too. If possible, when you're out, try and leave your valuable things in a cupboard which has an extra lock on it. So much for theft prevention. If you do get burgled though, there are ways to protect yourself here too. Try and get household insurance. Make a valuables list of all the items that you own, including things like keys and bank cards. Estimate their value and take the list to any reputable high street insurance broker and get a quote for household insurance. This is not very expensive and it will give you peace of mind. Another thing you can do is to get an ultraviolet pen and write your name and address on all your valuables. This will not be able to be seen in normal light, so your goods won't look any different, but your goods will be forever marked as your property. Before the safety talk continues, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen to the rest of the safety talk and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, more seriously, we must look at your personal safety. This especially applies to women. Men, of course, are usually better able to protect themselves and are under less risk in any case. First, let's look at where you live. Again, wherever you live, you should make sure that your door is locked securely, even when you're at home and even if you're not alone as people can leave your house without you knowing. So, in hall, lock that door at all times, especially at night. If you're in digs, keep the front door locked at all times and your own bedroom as well. If your bedroom has no lock, then get one put in. Get your landlord to do it, they usually will. It's a small price to pay for safety. Look at the windows in your house. Again, especially the ones in your bedroom. Make sure the window fastens securely and try to get an extra lock fitted. Keep curtains closed at night and also during the day too if you don't mind so that people can't see in. Get a chain fitted to your front door too and always have the chain on when you're at home. If you see someone often hanging around near your home then let someone know in your hall or the welfare office in the union will be able to advise you. We, of course, at the police station will always welcome you, and we will never scoff at your worries. We will not laugh at you, and we will take everything seriously. Next, let's look at when you're away from your home and walking about the streets. Naturally, you're more at risk at night, but even in the daytime, try to keep to busier areas which are well lit, and always try to have someone with you when you're travelling on foot. At night, do the same, but be more careful about it. If you're leaving the Union late at night, take advantage of the excellent minibus service that your Union puts on for you for your safety. The minibus gives priority to women and it will take you to your door. There are two minibuses available every night, leaving at regular intervals. If there's not one available, wait in the queue until one arrives. They will get you home safely in the end. If you're not at the Union and by yourself, try to get a taxi back rather than walk. I know it's more expensive, but it's worth the cost. I'm sure your parents would prefer you spending the extra money to make you safe. Also with taxis, always take a licensed taxi from a proper taxi rank or call a reputable company. Keep the number of a reputable company in your wallet and saved in your mobile. Then you'll always have access to a safe way home. 
I hope I haven't panicked you. Very few people do actually get attacked, but of course it does happen. By following these basic safety rules, you vastly reduce your chances of being a victim. The cardinal rule is don't be alone. Always have a friend with you if possible. That is the end of section 2. You'll now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a student and her tutor discussing an essay. First you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Come in. Ah, good morning Rachel. Have you come to talk about your extended essay? That's right Dr Jones. Have I come at a bad time? No, not at all. This is a good time in fact. Good, because I wanted to ask you what you thought about my decision on the subject. Yes, you initially wanted to write about working conditions in 19th century factories, but you were later contemplating looking at the conditions inside hospitals in 19th century northern towns. That's right. I thought about it for a long time and weighed up the pros and cons, and I didn't decide for ages. Well, I think you were right to stick with your first idea. There's so many better sources available on the subject. There are plenty of articles in magazines and the odd TV and radio program on the other subjects, but everything is rather superficial. There's no real academic knowledge to draw on. Yes, I found that out. I found lots of books, but nothing really to help me, even on the internet. In the end, when I decided on my first choice topic, I found lots of really good stuff in magazines, books and the internet. Particularly one book, which is the major reference that you'll see quoted all over the place. Well, I'm glad you came to that decision. Let's have a look at that essay now. What did you think? I've spent ages on it, but I'm only about 80% happy with it. Well, I wouldn't be too down about it. I think most of it is pretty good. I like the introduction which really set out your ideas clearly. The middle needs some attention, but the end was really first rate. What are the areas that need more work then? The main problem lies with your analysis of the statistics. You quote all the right numbers and you've got lots of fine tables and everything, but you need to look more closely at what the numbers mean and what implications they hold. Look at them again and try and explain more clearly the important parts. After that you need to have a look at your bibliography which is a bit shoddy. Yes, I was afraid of that. I always think that once I finish the essay then I'm done and so I don't put enough care into things like the bibliography. Still, I've plenty of time to get that and the other stuff sorted out. You've plenty of time, but don't leave it until the last minute, because you'll need to check it all again carefully when you're finished, and it would be a good idea if I looked over it again before its final submission. The deadline is the 28th of April, so shall I get it to you on the 24th? Will that be OK? Well, that won't leave you much time to change anything if I find anything else to do. How about a few days earlier than that? The 21st of April? I'll be able to get it back to you the day after on the 22nd then. That sounds great. Thank you.
You now have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the discussion and answer questions 27 to 30. I'd also like to ask you about that presentation that I have to give next month. Yes, what's the problem? Well, I've started work on it as I want to do a good job, but I can't seem to find much information on the subject in the library. OK. I'll jot down some ideas for you then. What subject are you presenting again? The three C's of the Great Reform Act in England in 1832. Ah, yes, the causes, course and consequences. Well, there should be plenty of material in the library on that, as it's such an important subject. Well, there should be, but it looks as though some first years are doing an essay on it, and so most of the books are out. I also don't want the run-of-the-mill books. I want my presentation to be a bit more in-depth. The best book for you would be Great Nineteenth Century Reform by Mark Needham. That book you can't take out. It's in the reference section only. You'll have to read it actually in the library itself. Then there was a great article in History Monthly on the Great Reform Act by Jim Wood. The issue was August 2003, I think. You'll find it in the library stack system. That's great. Anything else? Yes, there's another really good book on the subject that looks at the whole thing from a slightly different point of view. I remember when it came out it ruffled a few feathers. It's called Political Reform and it's by Rob Jenkins. The thing is though that I know our library hasn't got it. As you're preparing so far in advance though, you'll be able to order it through Interlibrary Loan. Just go to the library reception and they'll give you the forms to fill out. It'll come in about a week, I expect. OK, I'll do that straight away. Finally, there's the book, Reform and the Nineteenth Century, which I actually wrote. The library used to have a copy, but it's been lost, I think. I've got a copy at home, so I'll bring it in tomorrow. If you pop in tomorrow morning sometime, I'll let you borrow it for a week or so. Oh, that's fantastic. I didn't know you were an author, Dr Jones. Yes, I've done a few things. You'd better not lose it or spill coffee on it or anything, though. I'll take very good care of it, I promise you. I know you will, or I wouldn't lend it to you. So I'll see you tomorrow, then. Yes, thanks again. See you tomorrow. Bye. Bye. That is the end of section three. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a food science lecture. First you have some time to look at questions 31 to 36. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 36. Good evening ladies and gentlemen and welcome to this food science lecture. Today we're going to look at a foodstuff I'm sure we all recognise and use. Garlic. We will explore a little of its history and examine some of the many different ways it's been used over time. 
All around the world, for over 4,000 years, garlic has held many important roles in daily human life. It's been taken therapeutically and nutritionally. Folklore attributes garlic with good luck and with protection against evil. Its smell has been said to ward off sorcerers, werewolves, warlocks, and, of course, vampires. Although it's not certain when garlic was first discovered, it was probably dispersed by nomadic humans several thousand years ago. Garlic is originally indigenous to the desert region of Siberia. In this region, the summers are dry and hot, and there's very little precipitation. In order for the wild garlic plant to survive, it had to adapt to this harsh climate. Garlic had to grow when there was moisture, in the spring and fall, and it also had to be able to survive without water for the exceptionally dry summer and winter months. Garlic adapted to its environment, so that the growing cycle began in the fall to take advantage of the available precipitation. When the cold winters or the hot dry summers arrived, it became dormant. The cloves of the garlic plant store large amounts of food, which enable it to withstand long durations of dormancy. When the spring rains arrive, the plant can continue on its growth process. A healthy root system with relatively small leaves is a key to the survival of the plant. These traits make garlic a very hearty plant, capable of growing in poor soil in harsh climates with little or no care. Once discovered by humans, it's no wonder that garlic quickly became a staple crop of almost every civilization in the world. An Egyptian papyrus from 1500 BC recommends garlic for 22 ailments. The Egyptians fed it to slaves building the pyramids to increase their stamina. And during the building of the Great Pyramid, the construction workers lived on a diet consisting primarily of onion and garlic. When the workers were deprived of their ration of garlic, it caused work stoppages. Garlic was so valuable to the Egyptians that 15 pounds of garlic would purchase a healthy male slave. Ancient Egyptians worshipped garlic as a god, and its name was often invoked at oath-takings. In ancient Greece and Rome, it was claimed to have more uses, everything from repelling scorpions to treating dog bites and bladder infections to curing leprosy and asthma. Chinese scholars mentioned garlic in Sanskrit writings as early as 3000 BC. Garlic was so prized in ceremony and ritual, it's said that lambs offered for sacrifice in China were seasoned with garlic to make them more pleasing to the gods. Crusaders returning to Europe after faraway battles are generally credited with bringing garlic back with them to Europe. And there, in the Middle Ages, it was thought to prevent the plague. You now have some time to look at questions 37 to 40. Now listen to the rest of the lecture and answer questions 37 to 40. Modern research has confirmed the health benefits of garlic that our ancestors believed in. Garlic may even prevent cancer because it contains vitamins such as C, A and B, which stimulate the immune system to eliminate toxins and combat carcinogens. Research in 1858 by Louis Pasteur documented that garlic also kills bacteria. During World War II, when penicillin and sulfur drugs were scarce, garlic was used as an antiseptic to disinfect open wounds and prevent gangrene. The properties responsible for these medicinal effects are not clearly understood. Recent research identifies hundreds of volatile sulfur compounds in the herb, for this reason, it may also become a valuable treatment for AIDS. 
A study in China showed that people with the highest levels of dietary garlic have a reduced risk of stomach cancer. It can also kill 60 types of fungi and yeast, among them the common cause of athlete's foot. Japanese scientists test its effects on patients with lumbago and arthritis. Experts are split on the recommended daily amount of dietary garlic. From one to ten cloves. However, most agree that fresh garlic is better than in supplement form. How garlic is prepared also affects how it can be used. When the clove is cut or crushed, an enzyme contained within the plant cells combines with an amino acid. This creates a new compound called allicin. Which has been shown to kill 23 types of bacteria, including Salmonella and Staphylococcus. When garlic is heated, a different compound is formed that can prevent arteries from clogging and reduce blood pressure and cholesterol levels. The blood thinning quality of garlic may also be helpful in preventing heart attacks and strokes. Indian doctors. Have long pointed to studies that demonstrate garlic has a preventative effect on the development of arteriosclerosis, thrombosis, and hypertension. Now let's look at some other things. That is the end of section four. You will now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of.